Hello, it's Oscar Musabai from Influence Communications, and we are lucky to have our friend Darcy Lunsford from Butters here to help us today talk about the real estate market. And as you know, this is Influence Stories. So we do this every week to bring uh, a spotlight on important people in our community and have them tell us how their lives are going in this crazy time. And I've known Darcy for, for how long, Darcy? What do you think, like 20 years now? Oh my God, yeah, 20 years. <laughs> because yeah. we used to be reporters yeah. together. Yeah, we sure did. And Darcy was and the same. same, Oscar. Huh? We still look exactly the same. It's true. <laughs> Handsome and beautiful. And, and we'll let the audience decide which one is which. So as far as uh, what you do now, you had this incredible transition as successful as you, you were as a journalist and as an editor. Now you're as successful as a, as a commercial real estate broker. So I wanted to find out a little about what you do on a typical day at Butters. So I run our office leasing practice. So I focus on the leasing of office buildings. I work primarily on what's known as the landlord side. So I represent the building owners. Um, and I have a partner that works with me who's also a senior broker who represents the tenants. So we're, you know, a, a dynamic duo. So on most days, if I'm lucky, Oscar, I wake up, I get all beautified and I hit, I hit the streets of South Florida and I start showing office space to tenants. They're looking for buildings. And then um, if I'm lucky enough, then those showings lead to doing proposals and letters of intents and negotiating leases and uh, um, hopefully getting leases executed. And as I call it, butts in spaces. That's my business is try to get companies in spaces. So, you know, I really am kind of a microcosm of what's happening in the economy because as my day goes, as my showing goes, as my tenant goes, so goes the economy and people going to work. Well, I'm sorry, go ahead. I said, it's been a little different post COVID-19. Okay. It's been a little slower, but prior to going entering the pandemic, we were, you know, the, the, the economy, the office market was as strong as I've seen it, even going back to my day as a reporter. So that goes back 30 years. Yeah. And what do you, what do you uh, attribute this strength to before the pandemic? And we're going to talk about after as well. So going into the pandemic, the economy was very, very strong. They had had a, you know, a very low, a sub 4% unemployment rate in Florida. Uh, there was a big pursuit for talent. Uh, people wanted to move out of antiquated spaces, office spaces, and they wanted to move into more modern design philosophy spaces because we, it, was a, it was a war for talent. So you had the birth of the open floor plan, the communal areas, the cafe style kitchens, um, the breakout rooms, uh, so you, you had a lot of reasons that people were looking. They're also looking for efficiency. So they wanted to be able to get more people and, you know, less space and get more efficient with their real estate costs. Um, and people were growing, they were moving. Um, in South Florida, we had organic growth, which is good. And we also had incoming growth from people coming out of the Northeast. And I was even seeing people coming out of the Midwest that were coming to Florida because it's a low tax environment. Uh, so that was really what was driving it. Everybody felt good. The money was flowing. They were trying to position themselves to kind of capture the uh, market momentum. And I know we were talking a little about the office market right before we started, and you have a very positive outlook about the market. Can you tell us a little about that and why you have such a positive outlook? So, you know, as we entered this pandemic, we went in very strong. And the, the office market in terms of vacancy, rent growth, even the um, on the landlord side, the reduction of free rent and concessions had really been as compressed as I've seen it. I mean, very, very strong dynamic. So we went in in a very strong uh, position. We had had very little new construction. So while we've seen the big box industrial market explode with, you know, tens of millions of square feet in the South Florida market, the office market construction had been very, very restrained. Um, so we didn't have a lot of new products. So a lot of the product got absorbed. Uh, so we were in, you know, the I, I have a saying that I picked up from one of my landlords, which is it's a landlord's market about 10 minutes a decade. And right. we were just asking in right. our 10 minutes glory where we could push rates and push back on tenants. Right. Um, 
know, we went in a very strong position going into the pandemic uh-huh. and uh, coming out of the pandemic. So we've had a top down shock event, which is going to have some sort of impact on the overall economy beyond just the fact that we've got 3 million people unemployed. It's going to take time to absorb that, uh-huh. but it is limited to certain types of industries. So you had some pent up demand because uh-huh. we did nothing for seven weeks. So you had companies who's were expiring, who, you know, had to move for different reasons, companies that were counter cyclical, that were not dramatically impacted other than, you know, and you take a look at insurance companies and, you know, estate planning firms and financial services firms. So you had some companies that were not. So when we immediately came back to work, um, as the shelter employee, I noticed that our phones were starting to ring and that you had these that wanted to see spaces. And it's not every market, but it's in certain markets where you would have a dearth of space. Correct. So the first few weeks post quarantine lift um, has been encouraging. Oh. Now, whether this last extends yeah. as the summer wears on, uh, you know, we really don't know. Um, okay. Tenants are expecting a lot of you know, crisis type of discounting. So they're coming in and hoping to be able to leverage the softness in the market and the, you know, what's happened in the economy into some sort of discounts. So far, we really haven't seen that because landlords went into this market, you know, the underwriting was strong. They were not over leveraged. So we don't have that level of crisis from a, a debt, a debt ratio that we did, during the 2008 financial crisis. So we're just kind of we're coming in from a different position mm-hmm. and it, it does have the ability to get really bad, mm-hmm. but it'll really depend on how the summer progresses and then whether this is a one shock or a two shock event. If we're, you know, we get the vaccine and people feel more comfortable, then I think it we have to, we have to come out of this, but it's, you know, it's very encouraging just the at level of activity. And I will tell you, Oscar, you know, we have signed deals. We have signed pandemic deals. So we are ringing the bells around here at Butters. That's fantastic. And I know that uh, back in the day, industrial, the industrial sector was always a strength in the market, particularly because large companies like Amazon and others were coming and very interested in establishing a beachhead here for their expanding businesses. And I'd even heard that some of the uh, existing leases were being subleased and the companies that had the original leases were moving to larger spaces in the industrial market. So is that continuing? So the industrial market is, you know, the bell of the ball. And it's been the bell of the ball through this entire cycle. So you've seen more interest in industrial development, more interest from investors. Our phone rings here all the time with companies that are still looking to place money in industrial. Yeah. Um, so it's still, and you take a look at what happened when we all went to shut down the e-commerce market, which meant which makes up about forty percent of the industrial market these days. It is continuing to grow. It's continuing to be part of the, the the ecosystem of the supply chain. And I think that that's what's kind of booing the industrial market. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not some fracturing. It doesn't mean that, you know, they too are not going to take at least a glancing blow. But theirs is probably going to be very shallow, whereas other sectors, um, retail namely, uh, is probably going to take the hardest hit hospitality is taking a really hard hit and office, you know, is going to be not as hit as hard, although you'll have certain sectors that without hospitality, travel, uh, those sort of things. But, you know, I think that industrial will continue to be kind of the stalwart asset class. Um, and they're still doing leases. I mean, you know, even during the pandemic, I mean, my, my colleagues were doing leases mm-hmm. and getting done. Yeah. Well, I know that in industrial in particular, there's been a uh, a creep of automation into mm-hmm. that sector. And do you see right. this as an accelerator for that uh, evolution that there will be more automation in these buildings? Well, I think technology is always going to drive us to seek the path of least and most efficient um, execution. So I think that the trends that we have seen um, going forward Um, are being accelerated to a certain extent, because even during the pandemic, having that vital workforce, 
to be able to go to process the orders. I mean, you take a look at, you know, some of the things that happen with some of the, you know, the, the COVID disease getting into some of our distribution centers. And so I think that once you start to, you know, remove that human element to it, it becomes more uh, reliable, right? Yeah. So I think that these trends that you've seen in the past, there's nothing that's going to stop them. It's only going to accelerate them. Wow. I mean, it's it's both exciting and it does create some anxiety about what's around the corner. But Miami seems to be, as always, very dependent on Latin America. Correct. And however Latin America is doing, you know, if Latin America catches a cold specifically, we get pneumonia in some cases. Yeah, it's so, true. Do you think that and Latin remember, America is continuing to show partners, Brazil? Yeah, that's what I was yeah. going to ask you about Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. So as so it goes to Latin America, so goes South Florida, at least on the uh, the trade. And trade is such an important part of our economy. I mean, one in four jobs are related to trade, um, and it's not only Latin America. Obviously, that's our number one. We've got Brazil. Canada is a huge trade partner. You know, China. I was very concerned when we were in the trade war with China because that's also a, a huge trade partner um, and consumer of um, products. Uh, right. Canada is our number one uh, consumer of uh, uh, South Florida based manufacturing. So they they do go hand in hand. And since this has been a global crisis, I, I'm not sure we know exactly, um, you know, how it's going to play out. I mean, if we had a crystal ball, then you and I could, you know, go in and place bets and buy certain things, but we just have to see what's going to happen. But right. uh, you know, there's also some concern on the industrial sector about disruption in the supply chain, uh -huh. and that could cause a little bit of heartburn. But, you know, overall, I think that, you know, South Florida is going to uh, weather this storm well. Yeah. Um, they, they're, they're using the de-densification. Uh -huh. And, um, the, you know, I can remember being at an event and, you know, at the then head of real estate for Blackstone declared the suburban office building as being dead. And now all of a sudden, suburban office is sexy. We're bringing sexy back. You know, it's easy to park, not too congested, not too many elevators. And South Florida, either what it was going to continue to do very well. I mean, we are more suburban um, and we're not as dense. And I think that's one of the reasons that we did well during the pandemic is that, you know, not as dense. We're not as many people um, crowded into small spaces. And, you know, we've got great weather and a low tax environment. Right. Well, I know that. One of the things that we used to look at when we were covering and writing and editing stories on real estate was, you know, which sector is going to lead the recovery. And usually it was the residential, but I think yeah. this time it's going to be the industrial because residential, except for the really big projects, seems to have stalled a little bit. Uh, I mean, a lot of the stuff that's being built now is rent for rental. Maybe it was originally intended as condo, but it's sort of like what happened during the last cycle when things slowed down, where condominiums mm -hmm. turned to rentals. Do you see that same trend happening now that um, whatever is being built for residential is is gonna be uh, rental instead of condominium and that industrial and office will continue to lead the market? Um, well, maybe not office. I mean, office is not gonna lead us out of this. I mean, you've had some markets that have had a lot of office development, but traditionally, um, you know, office has not been leading us out. It has been the rooftops. And I think that we do have buoyancy in South Florida with regard to the residential. But the trends that you saw during the financial crisis with regards to the for rent housing, and at that point in time, it was financeability um, because, you know, you have to pre sell a certain number. Um, it, in order to be able to launch a condo. And uh, um, so that's one of the reasons that created a little bit of, you know, equilibrium in the condo market. You saw that house for the rent market. I, I think that the demand for rental rentals are still strong. I mean, I think that there's still going to be a, a desire for that. Um, and industrial is absolutely in the commercial sector. Mm -hmm. Industrial is, is, yeah, is definitely the strongest of the sectors and the most uh, and the most attractive because all the things that are happening, all the shifts and the way we consume are shifting towards these these hub and, hub and spokes. But what's going to happen to Oscar is that you're going to have, 
you're going to have the traditional hub and spoke, but you're also going to have these fulfillment centers that are going into the urban core as yeah. we see these short delivery times. And you're going to have Amazon and other companies, and they're already doing it, yeah. um, looking for smaller fulfillment centers. So the Amazon fulfillment center in you know Western Miami-Dade County is 850,000 square feet, right? It's one of their super hubs. Sure. And then you're going to see these centers that are going to go into the urban core areas to be able to get the one hour, the two hour delivery. Um, so the industrial market's changing, it's shifting, um, expanding right. from what we think. So, yeah, I think that that's a class leader. I, I do. I think it's a class leader. And I think that I did read a story about it was surprising um, on the residential sector how many deals were done. Did you read that story about during the pandemic where people are buying things online? Yeah. Um, well, residential could surprise us, yeah. um, especially we're in South Florida. So right. if you're in New York or New Jersey and you just spent all this time in lockdown in your you know 40 story building, all of a sudden we're looking pretty good. So oh. I, again, I think we're, we're well positioned yeah. and, you know, and we haven't factored in how seasonal I was waving by to my partner, Caroline. And we haven't factored in or determined if this is a seasonal um, type of virus and how the humidity and heat impacts it. So right. as we get more information and if we learn that, you know, it is seasonal, then there's going to be another reason to come to South Florida because, darn, we're hot all year yeah. round. So perhaps that's going to help us a little bit. Yeah, I live on Miami Beach and I've been surprised throughout the entire uh, period of time where we were in quarantine and we were supposed to be in our houses, how many people were walking around. And it's crazy. It's, it's, it, it's incredible because the, the Miami Beach is never going to change. I, I, I don't think that's, that's going to lose its value. And downtown has so much value now because of all the restaurants and the amenities that have been built. You could say that about Wynwood, you could say that about Design District, all these places that now have an incredible amount of uh, growing density. And it's it's really amazing to see that. And I think that people are gonna come back to Miami and the hotels in particular, people have been very worried about the hotels, but to me, it seems yeah. like one of the easiest uh, categories to transition because really, uh, environment where you're seeing people is at the, the front desk. But other than that, maybe you're in the room for half a day or uh, a quarter of the day. And then the rest of the time you're walking around on the street and, uh, and going to a restaurant or whatever. So uh, even though hotels are, are opening on Monday, um, I think they're going to come back pretty quickly. Yeah. And you may not be wrong. I mean, I think that a lot of what we have is impacted by travel tourism and the cruise industry. So it depends on how that goes, right? Yeah. And um, I think they're starting cruises back in August, if I'm not mistaken. And we'll have to see how many people are going to be flocking to South Florida um, to hop on a cruise. And, yeah. uh, um, you know, I, I've read different accounts with regards to, you know, how popular they're going to be. Um, and I guess it'll be a pricing sort of thing. And I know they're going to have new protocol in place yeah. so that it, you know, lessens the uh the infection rate so we'll just have to kind of see but i wouldn't be surprised oscar and i'm hoping that that's what happens is that you know we're not an easy place to drive to right so you're not going to drive so you have to get on a plane to sure. get here most of the time i mean because most of us maybe we're going to stay station to staycation but right. you know the, the, the travel industry goes the tourism industry goes you know we just have to kind of see if people when they start to get and I eat, I, I read that every day the capacity and the number of people traveling in the U.S. gets better, but it's yeah. still in a school to what it was pre coronavirus. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the hotels, I will say, I mean, I have a, a rosy outlook on on hotels, but yeah. we know personally that the uh, the labor uh portion of that industry has been hit extremely hard in South Florida and I'm sure about the country. And there are a lot of families that are looking for ways to find, uh, you know, meals. And uh, we've done some drives with some of our partners to uh, have them provide food that they can take home and cook themselves. Uh, and it's, you know, just family after family coming through and, and very happy that that resource is available. So yeah. while I I have a very positive outlook on 
on hotels, I think it is an industry that's going to take a little time to get back on its feet. Um, can you point to anything else? I mean, I've touched pretty much everything except retail. Can you point to any category that you retail, think is? Yeah, I'm the most concerned about, right? So retail was already changing. So you had, you know, big boxes, it, you know, the actual experience to going to a department store it, that had been, you know, going down and uh, you already had struggling retailers and they were changing to a destination an entertainment theme type of things that they had to have a better mousetrap to get people there. Right. I think this accelerates it. I mean, they, you know, I think that certain places retail is going to continue to be part of the experience itself. And Miami beach is no. probably one of those things. But if you take a look at the tenant mix on Lincoln road, it's sure. changed dramatically. It has shifted right. from your traditional stores to more of your destination, your eateries, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I do think that retail's in trouble. Um, and I think it's been in trouble for a long time. Right. I mean, I'm personally dismayed by this because you know how I love to shop. And I, you know, I will be the last American standing with my credit card to buy something at Bloomingdale's. That's right. You know? And of course, I'm just devastated by Neiman Marcus. Yes. You know, went into bankruptcy. Right. Um, you think that retail's in trouble and it was already in trouble. And um, so I, I think, you know, they call it the retail apocalypse. And I think there's, you know, that's hyperbole as everything we do in the media, right? Is it a level of hyperbole? I think there's some truth to that in that it's, you know, it, for the big box retailer, it's gonna be it's gonna be challenging. And you're already seeing, you know, a lot of these retailers, Pure One, I mean, you can just, and you take a look at the rate that these, that these retailers are fa failing over the past 24 months, and I don't have the data with me, but I've read the data and it's an acceleration. Yeah. So that's the category that I think is, you know, I would not wanna be, a you know a, an owner of retail shopping centers right now it well, would be very challenging it's funny you mentioned pier one because i read a story about pier one doing a lot of online work so much uh online sales that they actually had to hire people back to uh provide this the the volume of service that they were uh being required to to provide so uh, it sounds like there are opportunities in the market for older companies that have been around for decades, Pier One and others, to uh, Neiman Marcus, maybe to take this as a breather, reorganize, try to figure out a way of making experiences work, right? Because that's now the big trend in retail yeah. is creating experiences rather than just coming in to buy something. Well, I think any retailer that's going to survive um, and this has been true for the, say, the past five to seven years, has to be omni-channel. You have to be able to sell over multiple platforms. Sure. Um, the chat, and I, you know, and I, and I have read that the home goods uh, retailers were doing surprisingly well with online sales because we were nesting, right? We were all at home. We're sitting. At that we're sitting in the living room and we're staring at that darn lamp that we've hated for a decade. And what else you got to do? Go That's online and shop. And so. Let's see if this is sustainable because, you know, I personally don't like to shop for lamps and couches and beds without actually going and touching and feeling them. Now, I know the young folks live in a different world than me. Um, so I don't know. It's really hard to shop for it. Think about luxury furniture. How do you go and buy, buy an $8,000 sofa without actually sitting on it? So, I mean, I think there's going to be those barriers for a long term um, sustainable model where you're buying everything online. But I say that, and then I look at Wayfair yeah. and partner Caroline, who right. is our age, um, you, she had to buy a chair for her office. And, you know, she went to Wayfair because right. they've consistently been able to keep shipping low, consistent quality by a variety of vendors. So, I mean, if some of these can morph to being, you know, and Wayfair is kind of like an Amazon style for furnishings and home yep. goods, but it could morph to being more like that, where you're yep. bringing in lots of vendors and the quality is consistent, the delivery is consistent and free and timely, then maybe, but yep. then they become less of a, you know, a, a, a retailer per se, and more of a aggregator of different vendors and different sites. So they're more of like a curator. So a little bit more sober to that. But, you know, I, I think the way that people consume is just different than, you know, when I was 30. Yeah. We just don't, we consume differently. Oh, and yeah. I think you're going to, 
and I think you're going to see the really good brand stores that, you know, people, I think that you're going to see them survive. I don't know that you're going to see them survive in all the tertiary markets. I think you're going to see them survive in places. And I think that, you know, smaller tertiary markets may lose some of their gap stores or their, you know, other stores that can't sustain or there's not enough. And then those people are going to have to shop online, but in South Florida, you know, thank gosh, we have a strong shopping environment. Yes, we do. Well, Darcy, I want to thank you for giving us so much time and your wisdom. And uh, you're always wonderful to talk to. I always uh, feel privileged and, and happy to spend time with you. So thank you. I wish you a great weekend. I know we're almost there. And uh, hopefully yeah. you'll have some fun shopping ahead. I love it. All right, Oscar. Everybody take care. Everybody right. be safe. Wash your hands. See you later. Hey, right, bye.